Uh, in case you haven't heard, I, I don't think I, well, I couldn't have mentioned it because I didn't find out till afterward. We had 228 this morning, and so it's so good seeing attendance get back, you know, after the pandemic, which is naturally still going on and what have you, but uh, at some point we've got to live the life God intended, and it's been a tough time and still a difficult time for a lot of people in a lot of different places in the world, but we're so thankful that God's given us the privilege of meeting here tonight and so thankful to, uh, to observe what the Lord's been doing. Well, open your Bibles tonight to the book of Ecclesiastes. As you know, we've been studying from this book on Sunday evenings now for well, I don't know, a couple of months, something like that, and we're all the way over to chapter 6, and uh, this is a very short chapter, and Lord willing, we'll probably go through the entire chapter here tonight, Ecclesiastes chapter number 6, and if I just could sum it all up, it would have to do with the matter of seeking satisfaction. Well, uh, that's no special revelation, that takes us back where we started, that's what it's all been about so far, seeking satisfaction. And maybe in this section, the big question is, will prosperity please? Can we ever be pleased by prosperity? I've often said that prosperity has ruined more people than poverty ever thought about ruining, and I believe that to be true with all of my heart. But there's something within man that continues to, to crave after after what he doesn't have, regardless of how much he's got. And uh, Satan is a master at deception. You know, he he always seems to keep something before us that promises satisfaction. You know, if we'll just keep striving for what if you can just get this, or if you can just get that or the other, then you'll be satisfied. Well, it always ends up the same way. Without fail, it always ends up in disappointment and that's what we see in this chapter and Solomon wants us to consider three things three things three truths that really stand out in this chapter in the first six verses he lets us know that delight isn't found in fortune and fame Delight isn't found in fortune and fame. And again, uh, you know, we're talking about prosperity and the fact that sometimes, you know, people that are prosperous don't actually enjoy what they have. And uh, so keep that in mind, and it'll become very apparent in just a moment. Notice verse 1 and 2, because here he speaks about wealth and honor. He says, there is an evil which I have seen under the sun and is common among men, a man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth. Yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it, and it is vanity, and it is an evil disease." Now, this is a sad fact that we've already seen in our study of the book. And so uh, maybe somebody is wondering, well, why are we still talking about this? Because it bears repeating, and it needs to be repeated. Notice he says, this is common among men. And this is, this is something that regardless of what generation you're talking about, they need to hear these same truths. And regardless of how many times you and I have heard these particular verses or these particular truths, we need to hear them again and again and again because, you know, in spite of all of the evidence to the contrary, people still believe if I can just, if I can just get enough, enough money or enough property or enough this or that or if I can ascend to a high position, I will, I'll finally find happiness. But notice what he says. This is common among men. It's common among men. That's the way most people think. And it was true back then. It's still true today. That's why human nature never changes. Human needs never vary. It's always the same. The only thing that makes a permanent impact upon us is when God gives us a new nature. Now, 
Keep in mind that as Solomon naturally writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he directs every word and every line, keep in mind that he's also speaking from experience. We go all the way back to Second Chronicles in chapter number 1, and you remember the story where God assured him that he was going to give him wisdom. And to Solomon's credit, you know, when the Lord asked him, you know, what, uh, what do you want me to give you? Well, he could, have, he could have said, man, I want to be the richest person on earth. I, I, want to, I want to be the most powerful king on earth. He could have, you know, desired all kinds of things. He said, Lord, I, I, I need wisdom. I just need wisdom to guide these people uh, that uh, you've given me. And God said, I'm going to give you that wisdom, plus I'm going to give you great wealth in addition to that. You see, there's not anything wrong with wealth. It's the love of money. It's not the money. It's the love of it. And uh, so Solomon, in speaking from experience, and remember when we go back to the very first chapter where he tells us basically that he was conducting an experiment. And he says, I tried this, I tried that, I tried the other. I mean, he he had just about everything imaginable on his list. And he said, I tried this. Well, it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. You know, it, it, it all ended up in a failure. So I tried this other. Uh, I tried wine, I tried women, I tried works, I tried the whole nine yards and nothing satisfied. So keep that in mind that he's not just talking to us about something that he heard someone say. He's speaking out of the depths of his experience. I don't know of anyone that's ever been richer than Solomon. And in spite of all of that, he was absolutely miserable. So mark it down that fortune and fame is not going to satisfy you. But notice verse 33. There's something else that will not fulfill all of the desires of your heart. He says here that even a large family won't do it. He says, if a man beget a hundred children. Oh, well. <laughs> Oh, you know, some of you are thinking, well, boy, that would give you reason to be miserable, you know, if you had a hundred children. But, you know, people today can't appreciate this like folks did back in that day because back then, you know, having many children was looked upon as a, as a blessing, a great blessing from God. Uh, they thought of, you know, children, as they should have, as being a gift of God. And I can remember when Bev and I got married and we just, uh, uh, we, we, we had one child after another, five girls, no boys yet. Uh, the Lord ended up giving us three boys, but, uh, but before we got there, it was nothing but girls, girls, girls. And, uh, but, but I'm getting off my point. My point was every, every time that, you know, the family, you know, that day comes where you tell the family, guess what? <laughs> oh, don't tell me Bev's pregnant again. You, you could tell, it, it's, like, it's like they treated it like it was the worst thing in the world. And I, I can tell you, we never looked at it that way. We, we thank God for all of our children and, um, and count it in honor, but... Uh, but a hundred, I don't know, uh, I don't know if I can handle that, but, 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 but he's trying to make a point here because he's telling us that even that, a large family does not guarantee satisfaction. So fortune and fame, that's off the table, it's ruled out. A large family, that won't do it. Well, let's try something else. Look at verse 3, all the way down through verse 6. Now he stays on this theme, and he's still talking about the same thing here, that delight cannot be found in fortune and fame, in a large family, or in a long life. Verse 3. Notice, if a man beget a hundred children and live many years, so that the days of his years be many, and his soul... Uh, be not filled with good, and also uh, that he have no burial. I say that an untimely birth is better than he. Notice the phrase there where he says, not filled with good. That means that he is unable to enjoy or to be satisfied with what he has. And then notice the next phrase there, no burial. 
You know, that, that was considered the height of dishonor to not have a burial, for someone to die, for them to be so disrespected, dishonored, to ha- not having made any contribution to society, just dragged their body out of the city, to out to the, out to the dump, and, and just dispose of the body there. No burial. Uh, and uh, what a horrible thing that would be. And so he says that if his soul be not filled with good and also that he have no burial, I say that an untimely death is better than he. Now, I understand that Solomon is going to extremes because he's trying to drive home this point, that if you think that you can be satisfied by living X number of years, boy, if I could just, I can remember years ago thinking and and really, I didn't figure I'd live to be 60. When I got 60, I, I, you know, I, I felt like, well, I'm not that old. I, I'd really like to make it to, you know, 70. And uh, I got there, and I'm hoping for 80 now, of course. But, uh, but notice he says here, uh, the phrase is, not filled with good. And here's the point. Solomon is telling us that if a person could not enjoy what they, what they have, and if he leaves behind no pleasant memories, that's a reference to the no burial there, uh, he says an unboarded or a stillborn child is better off than a person like that. Now, his reasoning is based on the fact that although his life is, uh, I'm talking about the baby, that lifeless baby still born into this world misses all of the pleasures of life, it escapes the suffering that these other people go through. Now, I know it's hard for us to wrap our mind around a statement like this. It just doesn't sound right. But when we stop and think about it, you know, there, there's a price that we pay for living. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. And if you're going to live then you're going to experience trouble. There is no escape from it. That's the cost of it. Like I, like I often talk about love. Love is a costly thing. You, you can't love without it costing you something. Uh, and, and so he is simply saying here that, that if a man, you know, comes down to the end of life's road and he's not even respected enough to be buried, he said a stillborn baby is better off than he because at least... At least that stillborn baby has not gone through the horrible suffering that others have. So, verse 4, For he cometh in with vanity and departeth in darkness, and his name shall be, his name shall be covered with darkness. Verse 5, Moreover, he hath not seen the sun, nor known anything, and this hath more rest than the other. Now, This is his explanation of what he just said about that stillborn baby being better off than the depressed rich man who dies without a proper burial. This is what he's explaining here. And that the lifeless child has nothing, he knows nothing, but according to Solomon he's better off uh, than, than the person like that who, you know, has all of these things and yet suffers as a result of it. Now, notice he's going to keep up in the ante and going to more extreme. Verse 6, Yea, though he live a thousand years twice told. Now that's about as extreme as you can get, two thousand years. Yet, yet hath he seen no good, do not all go to one place. So he's simply saying if we live two thousand years, the same thing would still be true. And, you know, in his view, since everyone is subjected to hardships, since everyone is going to die, everybody's going to end up in the grave, he simply said, what's the difference? What difference does it make? So, see, he's saying, in essence, you might as well be dead as alive because to him, death would be preferable, you see. It'd be, be better off because you escape all of this suffering. Now, again, you have to understand where Solomon is coming from, how he's looking at this. And Solomon is trying to picture the natural man on earth under the sun is that phrase that he uses repeatedly. Now, he comes to the third 
thing that is on his mind in this chapter, beginning in verse 7. I should say the second thing, because in the first place here, we see that none of these other things uh, would, would bring any satisfaction. But now notice he talks about our desires never being fulfilled. He says, verse 7, All of the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. So the idea is that all a man does, speaking in general terms, I know you're the exception to that. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I, and I am. We like to think we are. But notice, all the labor of man is for his mouth. In other words, everything he does is for self-gratification and self-preservation. Uh, that, 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 and, and you know that's true, generally speaking, with people. That's all they're interested in, in gratifying themselves and preserving themselves. And no, notice the word here where he says, yet the appetite is not, is not filled. That word appetite, by the way, the Hebrew word that is translated appetite is actually the word soul. Now, what is the soul? You know, man is made up of three different parts. There's the body, the soul, and the spirit. Your body is the seat of world consciousness. You identify with the world around you through the five senses. You know, I touch this and I see this and I'm able to identify with my surroundings as a result of my my physical attributes. I'm able to to do these things. Now, my soul is something entirely different from my body. You can see my body, but you cannot see my soul. My soul is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotion. That's, uh, you know, the real you. Well, this, So it is the seat of self-consciousness. The body, the seat of world consciousness, and the spirit is the seat of God consciousness. That sets us apart you know, from every other creature on earth. And so it's important that whenever we read this, notice yet the appetite is the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions, he says, is not filled. And it's another way of saying that regardless of how much a man gets, he's always craving more. It's never enough. He always wants more. Regardless of how much he eats, regardless of how much he gains, He wants more. Verse 8. For what hath the wise man more than the fool? What hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? So when it comes to searching for satisfaction, he's telling us, and this is by way of a question, that the wise man has no advantage over the fool in this regard. I know I know we can all make a list of the advantages of wisdom over over folly. I understand that. The Bible does that very thing. I understand that. But in this regard, we're talking about people being satisfied here. And he's saying, based on this, there's no advantage of the wise man over the fool. Why? Because he says that both are labor to fulfill the desires of their heart. They're laboring to fulfill desires that can never be fully satisfied. That sound like anybody you know? It sounds like the world. That's what everybody's doing. But then notice what he adds. What hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? This speaking about a poor person who has understanding. He knows how to behave properly. He knows how to walk before the living. So, you know, he's poor, but at least he's got enough sense to know that even though I don't have much of this world's goods, I know there's a proper way to conduct myself. I know I ought to show kindness to others and so on and so forth. But Solomon is, insinuates here that, that even he, even that person that knows what is becoming and what is not, even that person is no better off than the fool in respects that the human desires are never satisfied by human effort. It's impossible. And and that's what he's wanting us to see. Now notice verse number 9. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. In other words, it's better to focus on what you've got instead of what you don't have. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could learn that lesson? 
to be content with what we have instead of dreaming about all of the things that we want. It's so easy for us to read those commands that are related to being content. And, you know, even Paul the Apostle said, I would have not known what sin was except the, you know, except the commandment said, Thou shalt not covet. He said, if it hadn't been for that, he said, I would have never really fully understood what sin was because he thought he, he thought he had checking all the boxes. He had it made. He was a great guy. All except for that one sin that woke him up. In fact, it did more than that. It put him to sleep in the sense he said, that slew me. And by that, I think he's talking about his self-righteousness was put to death the moment he realized, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. What convinced Paul, this religious good guy, what convinced him that he's a dirty, rotten sinner? Because the Bible says, thou shalt not covet, and he was guilty. And yet today we read those verses that tells us to be content with such things as we have, and we know in the depths of our heart that that we're not content. And so many people live in a state of discontentment. They're absolutely never satisfied in life regardless of what they do, regardless of what they have. And they're never content. And we treat it like it's some sort of oh, third-rate sin. You know, it's not one of the biggies, you know. And so as long as that's all I do, I'm in good shape. Well, you sure don't look at it like Paul did. He looked at it as about the worst thing imaginable. As one writer, I, I can't give him credit, I don't remember his name, but I, when I read it, I jotted it down, and he said the lesson taught is to make the best of existing circumstances, to enjoy the present, to control the roaming of fantasy. And, and, and you know, that's really easy to say, but it's hard to do, isn't it? I, I think if we'd all just stop and think for a moment here, we would all say that the best thing for us to do is be content with our existing circumstances and to enjoy the present instead of worrying about all of the things that we can't do and the things that we don't have. We'd be so much better off if we just said, you know, this this is it. This is the way it is. It is what it is, and we might as well accept it. Well, that brings us down to the third section in this chapter, in the last section. And he tells us here in verses 10, 11, and 12 that debates are futile. Notice verse 10, that which hath been is named already, and it is known that it's, it is man. And neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. I've got to confess that the first part of this verse is really, really hard to understand. You know, sometimes the wisest thing you can say to a person and over the years, and Brother Kenneth will tell you the same thing. We have people, you know, will ask, well, can I talk to you just a minute about this verse or that verse? And, and uh, you, know, you know right then this is probably going to be one of those one of those whoppers, you know, that one of those biggies that, you know, they've already researched it and they can't find the answer and they're hoping that you've got it in your back pocket somewhere. But, you know, the best thing, if you don't know the answer, just tell them, I don't know. I, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, I'll try to find out. I'll get in the Bible and, uh, you know, don't you just love it when somebody comes up to you and, and, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, they say, man, I tell you, I've, uh, boy, uh, uh, Habakkuk uh, chapter 2, verse 99 or something, that, that has been such a blessing to me lately. And it's like, in other words, they're, they're talking about it like, oh, oh, you do know that verse, don't you? You know, and... and and it puts you on the spot. How do you, I can't hardly remember my address half the time, let alone somebody say, I remember all the books of the Bible. Well, I've got it all written down right here in the front. I don't need to, I don't need to remember all of those things. I guess I'm getting off track, but I'm just telling you, there are things hard to understand. And this this is one of them. If you don't believe me, well, you just read all of the various commentaries that try to explain this, 
and you walk away scratching your head because even the most highly educated, respected scholars do not agree on what this verse means, the first part of this verse, that is. And so, uh, you know, the best way to, to weed out a bunch of those so-called scholars is to just find out what they believe about the King James Version of the Bible. And, and if they don't have that nailed down shut, if they're not right on that, I don't pay any attention to anything else they've got to say. Because I'm not going to listen to somebody that so disrespects God's Word that they start using these modern versions. Oh, yeah, you know, this is based on, this is based on the older manuscripts. So what? What does that have to do with anything? Those older manuscripts existed when the King James Version was translated and, and and even before that, you go back to the Masoretic texts, and those texts ex- existed back then, but they were discarded because they had evidence that they were not trustworthy. So, you know, centuries later, someone comes along with these old manuscripts that that had been discarded, and, and all of a sudden they get the bright idea, you know, I could base a Bible on these. And, you know, my byline is that older is better and so I'd sell a million copies of these and make a lot of money, and I don't know that they thought it out like that. Maybe I shouldn't make an accusation like that. But that's what it amounts to. When somebody disrespects the King James Version of the Bible that's been around all of these years and has never one time ever in any way proven to be false, then I just rule them off of my list. But even then... I don't find a clear explanation. So I, I, I'm trying to be as honest as I can and tell you this is a tough verse to try to comprehend. So the best thing to do in a case like this is to look at each word and each phrase in the verse and prayerfully ask God to guide you. And so notice the phrases here. And, and the key phrase is the second, I believe. Notice what he says. And it is known that it is man. So something is known, whatever he's talking about, it is known that it is man. And I believe that's defining the first phrase, right? Isn't that, wouldn't that be the natural explanation? Notice, that which hath been, that's where he starts. That which hath been. What's he talking about? That which is known, notice he says, and it is known that it is man. So when we talk about that which hath been, we're talking about man. And notice this. He says, and, and it is who is named already. Named already. The word already means long ago. And so now this is starting to make sense to me when I look at each phrase here and you consider that the word man is the word for Adam. And Adam, of course, is a word that means red. It was a reference to the red dust from which man was made. And you go back to Genesis chapter 2 and you see there that it was God who named man whenever he was created. So the question is, what is the point of all of this? Well, I, I, I don't know how that impacts you, but it reminds me of this, that God is in control. So let's just read it slowly again. That which hath been is named already. And is known that it is man. It's already happened long ago, already. He was named, who named him? Well, we know that comparing Scripture with Scripture that God is the one who named him. And so there's no question about that. So what's he telling us? He's telling us that God is in the in control of this. Now remember, he's just been talking about all of these things, all of these desires. And go look back at verse 9 again. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desires. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. So in our pursuit of something that will make us happy and make us glad, that will fulfill all of our desires, we keep failing even though God keeps warning us over and over and over again that it's not going to work and we just keep on that same route going in the wrong direction. But notice here's the real kicker going back, back to what he says here in verse number 10. 
Neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. That's another, and it's easy to see the connection, right, between this and what he just said. Talking about man who's been named already. Who named him? God did. And he's telling us that we're not to contend with him that is mightier than he. You know, a lot of times, even as Christian people, we tend to resent what God disallows in our life. You see, it's, we have the vestiges of our old nature. Even after we're saved and we get a new nature, they're the leftovers, you might say, the vestiges of our old nature that, that still wants to control things. We, we want to run the show. We don't want somebody telling us what to do. I mean, you know, we want to do our own thing. And, and that's where all of a sudden we find ourselves in contention against God because God wants Him one thing for us and our flesh, our old fleshly desire wants something else. We want to satisfy ourselves. So when things don't work out the way that we desire, we're tempted to question God, right? We, we all do it. Don't tell me you don't. We all do. Sometimes we wonder why. Why this? Why me? Why now? We all have. And, and look, that can be a legitimate question sometimes. There's not anything wrong with wondering why. As I've often said, you know, it's okay. It's okay to mourn, but not to murmur. And it's okay for us to wonder why God's doing this. But whenever we begin to complain about it and begin to argue with God, as it were, we're in dangerous territory because quarreling with God is a waste of time. More than that, it's dangerous. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse number 9 says, Woe. And anytime you see that word, woe, W-O-E, you better stop and pay attention. Something bad is about to happen. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the, uh, with the potsherds uh, of the earth, and shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou, or, or thy work? Uh, he hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begattest thou? Or to the woman, what hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Notice, command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all of their host have I commanded. God wants us to know that He is in control. Now, if we really believe that, I, I preached some time ago, and I started the message by asking, you know, do you trust God's plan? Trust God's plan for your life. We should, but the fact of the matter is sometimes we don't really, evidently based on our behavior. Because God will say things like, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And then, boy, you let us get in a bind of some sort, and there we sit wringing our hands and worrying ourselves into a state of panic, scared to death like God's going to let us starve or something, you see. Or it might be that God has denied us the, uh, the, the ability to do certain things that we'd love to do. And our natural inclination is for us to argue with God even complain about God and what He does. And the day that we learn that we need to accept whatever God appoints or whatever God allows, and those are two different things, whatever God appoints or whatever He allows in our life, that's the day that we'll begin to find real contentment and peace in our heart knowing that He doesn't make any mistakes. God is in control. So whenever you look back upon whether it's that little stillborn baby or here's the fellow over here with a ton of money but he's miserable and what have you and things happen to people and, and the one factor above all we need to keep in mind is that God is in control. Verse 11, Seeing there be many things that increase vanity... 
what is man the better? Notice concerning all of these things that increase vanity. And notice he says, there be many. I don't have any idea what all he might have had in mind. I, you know, I, we could go back through this book of the Bible and look at all of the things he does mention. But uh, he says, there be many. I'm quite certain there are many more things that increases vanity than what he's telling us about. But notice then he says, seeing that this is true. Got all of these things that increase vanity. He says, what is man the better? In other words, since it all leads to vanity, what, what difference does the circumstances make? It shouldn't make any difference. Now, before you try to answer that question, read this last verse. Verse 12. For who knoweth what is good for man in this life? Isn't that interesting? For who knoweth what is good for man in this life? All the days of his vain life which he spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? This is a tremendous statement because we're not nearly as smart as we like to think we are. And many times we don't even, you know, many times we... We think we know what's best for us when we don't. Because the thing that's best for us might be something that totally erases the plans that we've made for ourselves. We had all these plans of things that we hoped would bring great satisfaction, and now they're all gone. And God, God sees something down the road that He wants us to avoid. And God puts up a roadblock and He stops us from going in that direction. And we, in our natural mind, think of the fact that He has just deprived me of this great pleasure when in reality God is protecting you. And so we need to consider that, you know, to be good and helpful uh, sometimes might be bad and harmful. And sometimes it's vice versa, by the way, because we can't see the future. He says, for who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? You know, even if we had the power to arrange life as we please, naturally we don't. But think about it. What if, what if God made you God for a day? And so you can arrange life however you, however you please. You know what would happen? You'd make a mess out of it. So would I. Because we don't have the wisdom to arrange our life wisely. You know, just let God, say, gives you the ability to pick and choose all your circumstances. You just make you a list. Mark off everything you don't want to experience. And over here, make a list of the things that you'd like to experience and what have you. So you can pick and choose all of those things naturally we would all choose those things that are pleasurable and painless. That's the path we would take. We want something that is pleasurable, something that is painless. So we're going, we're going to be making choices on, uh, on what we felt would help to satisfy us the most. And uh, in reality, sometimes it's exactly the opposite of what God does. And so... In doing that, we would render our, a great injustice to ourselves. Sometimes God has to hurt us or let us get hurt to help us. I remember years ago when I was pastoring in Tennessee, and I started having these, these pains I'd never had before. It, it wasn't down in the stomach. It was right, right up right in here. One of the worst pains I'd ever experienced. I can remember rolling around in the floor and tears in my eyes. I, I really, I thought I was having a heart attack and I thought I was dying. And anyway, when I went to the doctor, they said, well, uh, and they, they run a few tests and said, uh, you've got gallstones. Uh, and said, now here's the thing about gallstones, said, uh, you might go several months and never have another attack like that. Or said you might have another one tomorrow. Kind of depends on how much pecan pie you eat. But 
I looked at the doctor and I told him, if there is ever a chance, ever a chance of me having another attack like that, I want you to cut it out, get it out, get rid of it. And he did. And he told me at the beginning, he said, now I want to tell you, this surgery hurts even more than heart surgery. And he explained why. Because back then, they didn't do it like they do nowadays. You know, back then they cut me from right here, all down around, all the way up here. And I remember we had a we had a, a preacher's conference scheduled at the church just a short while after I'd spent a week in the hospital. And after I got out, he said, I don't want you driving for another week. So all them muscles have got to heal in there. And I can remember sitting up there on the platform during that preacher's conference and just about to fall over with pain. It was excruciating. But boy, I, I had to go through that. But a lot of good stuff came out. I can eat anything now. I can eat pecan pie. It doesn't make corn on the cob. doesn't make any difference. Now, I know that's a crude illustration, but, but I mean it when I say, folks, sometimes when we go through these, these difficult things in life, and I'm not trying to minimize anybody's problems. I know there are things that hurt deeply, and sometimes we see God allowing things to happen that we can't possibly understand. You know, we see maybe the death of a, of a child, a young child, and uh, uh, our son Jason, is a, he's an investigator, a detective on the traffic division, and, uh, and where, where there's a you know, a major accident involving death. He's the guy they call out to investigate it and what have you. And he can tell you the effect it has on those police officers looking at those uh, at those dead bodies and especially those little children. And, and we look at that and uh, we can't understand that. But I'm, I'm telling you, the answer is not for us to get angry and bitter toward God and spend the rest of our life in mourning about that. And here's why. You, you don't know the future. That, that little child, they're safe. They're safe. When they leave here, they're going to be with the Lord. They're safe. But listen, we have no idea what it is that God might have spared them from because God can see down the road 20 years, 30 years from now, and God saved them from some horrible, terrible disaster in their life. How dare we blame God? How dare the clay complain to the potter because He made us such? One more verse, and I'm through. Psalms 115. Verse 3, But our God is in the heavens, and He hath done whatsoever He hath pleased. Is that all right with you? Amen. It better be, because there ain't nothing we can do to change it. He's done what He pleased, and He doesn't make any mistakes. I, this is another one of those times where what kind of an invitation do you give? Well, I, I'm not sure about that, but I am sure that tonight that maybe God is speaking to somebody's heart about something. It might be you just want to come, just come and pray. You know, people used to do that, have a burden on their heart or a need in their life, and they just wanted to spend some time in prayer before they left. But whatever it is that God's dealing with you about we encourage you to take care of that business tonight before you leave. And we're all going to stand, Tim, and the musicians are coming. We're going to extend this invitation, and we encourage you to come tonight and let God have His way in your life. Father, as we come before Your throne of grace tonight, we understand that we don't deserve anything whatsoever. And yet, Lord, because of Your grace, we know that we have this wonderful privilege of bringing our needs before You and I just pray tonight that you might glorify yourself by meeting the needs of your people. And Lord, help us. Help us to trust your plan for our life. And rather than getting bitter and complaining, God, help us to accept whatever you allow, whatever you appoint, knowing that, that, that you do all things perfect. And may we just commit our ways unto you, knowing you never make a mistake. And you always have our best interests at heart. 
for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.